Thank you for that wonderful welcome and introduction of all of us. Um, it's so great to be here on behalf of RBC and specifically the Corporate Citizenship and ESG team. And I just want to give a quick shout out, not at the end, but right now, to all the folks who are part of this uh, organizing committee. And really, we appreciate all the behind scenes work to make this come to life every year. And this is one of my favorite activations of our social impact and innovation team and citizenship more broadly. So let's get right into it since intros are already done. Uh, so just to give some context, in April 2022, Employment and Social Development Canada published the 13 ways to modernize youth employment in Canada, strategies for a new world of work report. And in this report, it identified six main barriers for successful youth employment integration and career development. Lack of pertinent labor market information available for youth, reluctance from employers to hire youth, precarious and uncertain job opportunities, lack of transferable skills and competencies for youth to have dynamic careers, uh, systemic and indirect discrimination in the workforce, and lack of adequate resources for the fastest growing population segment in Canada, Indigenous youth. So the purpose of today's panel is really to discuss solutions, right, for these barriers uh, from a cross-sector collaboration perspective. And as you heard, we have folks here from uh, diverse sectors, and so we hopefully will get holistic perspective today. So getting right into it, number one, skills. So much has changed since the pandemic, COVID pandemic. Of course, during the pandemic, it was hard for young people to navigate job prospects and figure out you know, what skills they needed to be successful in a virtual world. And now, I mean, that was tough, of course. Now we understand that, of course, critical thinking, collaboration, digital literacy, financial skills, they're, they're very important, but post-recovery, what skills are you seeing that are shaping the workforce, uh, highlighting skills that are required for you to succeed in landing meaningful work? Uh, I'll maybe point it to media first, and then Jake and then Shree. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, the pandemic did disrupt many things with its employment sector, the education sector, and did shift the need for skills. Um, at Tripen, we work with a network of over 27 employees. 27,000 employers from across the country, and we constantly noticed trends in the employment sector and the need for skills. Um, and early in the pandemic, the kind of the major focus of many employers was actually on digital transformation skills. And for the youth who might not be aware of what does that mean, it's, it's the supporting businesses or business components that are not digital to actually transfer to digital formats. Um, so there was a huge push for employers to build websites to be able to um, look at data to analyze the customer to see what's happening to help the business grow. But as we transitioned away from that phase, many employers are, I'm going to coin that term because I don't think it exists, post digital transformation phase where they start to look deeper in the use of technology, things like cybersecurity, things like data analysis, um, things like AI machine learning. But then that's what the employer want. Yet when you finish high school and you transition to higher ed, there's not necessarily a clear path to employment. Mm -hmm. And there's many kind of gaps in between. Um, so big focus of Ripen's work and also the collaboration that we have with RBC is to offer student access to employer project while they do their, their employment, sorry, while they do the courses and learning. And this actually aligns with one of the last presentations on being able to offer students practical work experiences as they build the skills and build their portfolio of experiences before they graduate. Um, there's also a huge push and need for soft skills, things like collaboration, things like leadership, things like time management. But at the same time, if you are starting your first job virtually and you have never been mentored or coached on those things, and as someone who I call myself a professional student of 12 years or plus, you don't really learn those skills. No one teach you how to time manage. No one teach you how to talk to your manager. No one teach you anything. Luckily, I had amazing bosses that coached me and that mentored me, but many youth don't have the opportunity. And many employers are noticing the, the, the importance of soft and transferable skills for youth. Um, and that piece of employer mentorship is definitely crucial and important. So the burden is not just on the youth, but it's also on the employers to be able to actually build 
meaningful opportunities for youth to build the soft skills and to be able to build um, that transferable skills that they can take with them from one job to the other. And they noticed that emerging growth in micro-credentials and skills that align with industry needs specifically, uh, which is an alternative path to many, many um, students. And I know I'm sure many people on the panel will talk about actually the upskilling opportunities that are available, which is also another crucial trend. And I'll just mention two last quick things. One of them is, if we look, a survey was conducted across Canada and the US to look at motivators of youth to transition to education. And in 20, the year 2000, roughly 50% of youth said employment outcome was the key motiv motivator to pursue an education. By the year 2019, just before the famous March 2020 happened, mm -hmm. um, that number went up to 90%. And the survey has not published a new result now, but I'm estimating that number have gone up closer to 100% because everyone sees the impact of employment and the workforce specifically. Um, the last story I'll mention very quickly um, is back when I used to work in actually making prosthetics and assistive technology, most of my work was with youth mainly. And according to some definition, I just transitioned out of my youth phase. Um, but most of my work was actually globally training youth who come from places where they don't necessarily go to, to post-secondary institutions to learn how to build basic skills to produce prosthetics and assistive technology for their community. And many organizations that I worked with would always ask me, media, why do you not work with adults or older people? And I always tell them because youth these days are the last generation that witnessed many of those changes and they might be the last group that could do anything to solve the issue. And they have so much motivator, they have so much strength and, and impact driven um, kind of mindset, uh, which is something that we actually see now with the youth that we work at, with at Ripen, is that many of them care about the impact and the type of the projects they work with, which is something very important for employers to also help youth harvest that mindset and to be able to give back to the community, which is another piece that employers need to kind of consider as they work with youth, is that they're impact-driven youth and they value being able to give back to the community and address social issues. Thanks, Media. Jake, <coughs> well, as you've just finished a cough, do you want to jump on that? What are, what are some it. of the skills that you're seeing in this post-pandemic period that are critical for young people in landing those jobs? Happy to jump in. I was trying to save the cough for after you. And while my mic was not on, I just got back from Mexico City. And while I'm not sick, I am very much coughing up the pollution in Mexico City in a way that uh, is terrifying and, and makes me grateful for the clean, amazing air that we have here in Toronto. Um, I had sort of three thoughts. One related to skills that have accelerated dramatically as a result of the pandemic. And, and you mentioned some from the sort of company perspective, I would say from the student perspective or from the youth perspective, those skills really are how do you do things like networking, which is for better or worse how 80% of people get a job online and now hybrid. Uh, online was hard. In some ways, I would argue harder than it's ever been because that sort of warmth of shaking a person's hand or smiling at them in person where you can like literally sort of, when I present, I, I way prefer presenting in person because you can smell my pheromones. I know that sounds weird, but like there is an energy in this room that doesn't exist online. And so the same is true when you're shaking somebody's hand, those connections just didn't feel as human, as important when they were on a Zoom call. And so it required that folks, you all learn new skills in terms of your Zoom coffee chats with folks. And, and I think that is a good segue to the single most important way to practice, and I'll, I'll conclude on a, a, another example of this, the skills that you all now need to find jobs, which is you have to do them over and over and over again. And coffee chats or Zoom chats, or you know, there's a million different words for this, but basically the times when you meet someone, sure, to look for a job, but I would actually characterize it every time as to just discover more about them and their professional life. And if you can provide value to them in those coffee chats, whether on Zoom, again, harder, but in some cases you can sort of have an agenda on Zoom in a much more relaxed manner than you would in person, right? You show up to a coffee shop, it's sort of awkward when you're like, these are the 14 things I want to accomplish over this coffee. You do it on Zoom and it sort of feels more natural. So use that structure to get out of a coffee chat the things that you need, which is, and again, I would not say a job, but rather, connections to other people to have the same kinds of conversations with. 
How do you have three more conversations that follow up with that? And my universal tip to make this as easy as possible for them is to literally write the introductions for them after the meeting. So you leave a coffee chat on Zoom, you've talked about somebody's life and profession in healthcare, you've brought up three intentionally sort of solicited from them, pulled out of them three individuals that might be interesting to talk to in addition to them. And then at the end, you send them an email or you send them an email on LinkedIn and you say, wonderful chatting with you about all these things. Here's the links I talked about. You wanna give them something. If you're open to it, these are the three people you mentioned that I'd love to talk to. Here's an email that you can use to introduce me to them. And if not, no problem. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciated talking to you. Make it easy. Um, <clears throat> to move to the way that I wish people were hired. So unfortunately, most people are hired based on who they know and who have the fewest connections, youth. So that's obviously your disadvantage and I explained one way to overcome that disadvantage. On the other hand, the way people should be hired these days, people are all talking about skills-based hiring or skills-based learning. And what that basically means is you should be matched to a job based on your current skills and your potential skills. And yet very few people are, right? We're talking probably under 10%. But the smart employers, the RBCs of this world, my wife works at Accenture, a lot of the big employers are moving towards skills-based hiring. And if you can leverage the fact, if you can use the fact that everybody is currently talking about this more equitable, efficient, productive means of hiring and learning, by just listing your own skills when you apply for a job and saying, don't hire the person who's best connected to this job, rather, hire the person who has the most potential to actually do the job. So that's number two. And then the last thing is practice. I know this is sort of an annoying statement, but I was thinking about how once or twice a week now, I give a presentation like this. And they range from Hershey, Pennsylvania to a month ago, it was in Davos. And I have no training in presenting. I've never taken like a speaker's course, or a, but rather I just do it over and over and over again. And I'm far from a pro, but it feels a lot easier now than it did five or 10 years ago because I do it so often. And so let's just take the same analogy and apply it to those coffee chats. The more you have, the better you'll be at them. Just like the more interviews you do, it doesn't matter whether you get the job or not. Do as many as you possibly can because that practice makes perfect. Thank you, Jake, that's so critical. And I know we're all fighting um fatigue post meal. So I, I would invite everyone to just kind of give yourself a little bit of a roll or like a move <laughs> to wake up a little bit because I'm feeling it too. Because uh, some of the advice that Jake just shared is so critical, like the need to practice networking. I was one of those kids who hated mingling and social settings and like need introducing yourself to people you don't know. But you said a lot of these jobs are based on your networks and getting yourself out there. And this is a very digital generation but it's still very awkward, right? Um, to put yourself out there and say like, you know, can I uh, talk to you, get some advice? How do I navigate my next job or opportunity? And the focus on skills I think is really key because some folks think that it's all about your schooling, your credentials, but really I think we're moving to a skills-based uh, approach to securing jobs. And so I think that's a really important point that you just shared. Shreef, do you want to get in on this? What are your, what are your thoughts on um, what the, the future skills are? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I think that, can you hear me okay? Just making sure. You told me to, to yell into the mic, so I'm just like, <laughs> not yell, just that if you're sitting, it doesn't sound as loud. Right. So I just want to make sure you can all hear me. But um, the main, uh, it's really interesting. We're the most, uh, we're the most connected uh, digitally, I think, than we've ever been, obviously, in history. And we're also experiencing a lot of disconnection. Mm -hmm. And I find that, um, and, in way, and, and that there's a lot of disconnection that is happening as an unintended result of digital connection. Uh, and, and so what we're finding is, especially, you know, coming back into in-person spaces, we're finding that the boundaries of relationships for some folks have become very unclear. Uh, we're finding that um, social skills in terms of how to have effective interpersonal kind of conversations, how to manage conflict, how to interact um, effectively in a team, that some of the magic of what happens in person um, is lost, has been lost. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and we're also seeing some, uh, some interesting you know, just some interesting effects around increased, uh, as a result of this disconnection, 
a series of outcomes for young people that are uh, that have not improved or gotten worse in some cases, you know, like increased anxiety, increased stress, uh, increased, um, you know, confusion about what to do next. And so part of um, part of what we've been trying to do at the Students Commission of Canada through our Art of Work Youth Employment Program is to see a job not just as uh, a job uh, in, the, in the sense that it's like you, you, you punch in, you punch out, but see a job experience as an opportunity to build, build those critical skills and to walk the talk in terms of employing young people of all ages and of all and, and of diverse backgrounds. And uh, so, so for us, um, we've been really trying to uh, somewhat um, aggressively get back into the in-person space uh, to be able to make those digital spaces safer, to be able to have the, the, the conversations that, that we need to have and to build that skill as much in person as we can so that when you're on a digital space, you can remember who that person was and you can remember that there is actually a human behind the Zoom right. screen. We've seen a little bit of, um, you know, seen a, a lot of um, assigning of like an expectation on a human without necessarily knowing uh, in lots of spaces without necessarily knowing who that 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 human is. What do you and, mean by that? Just, just like, just that, um, just that. I think that when we're on our, our screens, um, you know, there's lots of different things that we're getting exposed to, and and part of the chat pass or chatter pass group has talked about this. Like the, it's it it helps to put us into camps and corners, right? And then it's it, it's very difficult to sift through that the noise and, and the noise and really, uh, you know, not take something uh, that. In one way, it's a it's a benefit because you get access to so much information that previous generations didn't have access to. And there's actually been like a, an, uh, in some ways it's been a great in some ways it's been a great equalizer. In other ways, it's been a great divider. Right? It's helped to kind of have people potentially ascribe different um, uh, different opinions or thoughts based on what's online. And then, you know, there's the research about Zoom interactions that they're less. They're less trusting because you can't pick up on the 80% of nonverbal communication, right? Like uh, it, there, they can be places of, of mistrust. So, so what are the skills? Uh, so the skills that we're thinking about uh, trying to reinforce or bring back in some ways now that we've been doing this again for the past few months is really around that social, like interpersonal skills, conflict resolution skills. Uh, uh, you know how to kind of think critically about the information that you're you're processing and receiving, and to really question the sources of information, credibility, like determine the credibility, reliability, accuracy, like yeah. just really practicing those critical thinking skills is a critical part of how we do this. And so uh, that's been an interesting kind of. I mean, I think 20 years from now, we'll all look back at, like on this time as like whoa, like we're, and we're in it right now, but when. When you reflect on it, it's a bit different. Like we still don't fully know the impacts of what those two or three years of, of lockdown on lockdown have done. And these are some initial signs of what we're seeing. Maybe if I can jump in with one quick note because I completely agree with Sharif and I want to sort of reverse it and ask you all for something. Yeah. As an old person now, which is sort of shocking for me to say because I still picture myself as like 15, um, I am in some ways appalled at the dual loss of humanity as a result of the pandemic. In some ways, we got lucky. We lost a lot of lives. We lost a lot of incredibly important people. But we had a vaccine, and less people died than in any global pandemic in history. At the same time, some of what Sharif is describing is the loss of a different kind of humanity. The fact that so much of my life is now mediated by the internet or a screen that I literally feel less human, and I certainly feel less other humans than I ever have. And I don't think my generation can fix that. I think we screwed it up, to be frank. I probably should use more careful language, but we messed it up. And I think you all are basically the only ones right now that can save us from it. And the way to save us from it is to do exactly what Sharif said, which is to see the human behind the screen and treat them that way. How many people in this room have done a job interview on Zoom or WebEx or any of these platforms? Oh, okay. More than I thought, actually. I was gonna, the next question was going to be schooling, which I know most people have done during the pandemic. But that kind of goes to show, like, even job interviews are happening virtually now. Like, how do you pick up on cues? How do you, like, read the other person? I just met some of the team that we have this week. Right. For the first time. <laughs> For the first <laughs> time. In person. We've yeah. met on Zoom, but I think the in-person experience is 
you know, I can't speak for the, the people that I've met, but I, I've learned a lot more in one week than in the past six months of some six months to a year, two or three years of folks uh, of being on Zoom. And it's just, you can't beat it. And, and I know we can't do a conference like this for thousands of people, but this in-person, these, you know, we can't lose the in-person magic. It, we need to see the digital, uh, the digital piece as uh, as something that reinforces what we've done in person, rather than something that replaces it. Okay, so moving on to supports, Akosua, maybe you can chime in. You know, how can we help with this? Help support young people with gaining the skills that they need to succeed moving forward. Yeah, um, I want to build up oh, a part of. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, there we Sorry. go. Sorry, um, I'm just eating up that mic. Um, <laughs> so, part of uh, what Sharif had said uh, with respect to uh, the pandemic throwing off the skill set and, and the, the types of interactions you have with youth um, are shared. Like, first work, we are Ontario's Youth Employment Network. We represent um, youth employment service agencies all across Ontario, but I do sit on a coalition that has other associations all across Canada. Um, so there's our like you know our BC sister association in Quebec as well, and um, I can keep going. But essentially, what we try to do as community support, so we are largely government funded. Um, we try to provide free access for youth, um, not try to, we do uh, <laughs> free access for youth uh, to get those wraparound supports they need. Right. So when we uh, a part of that skill building is that financial literacy component, the digital learning, um, even access to digital resources. Because we, what we found in the pandemic um, is there are so, the digital divide was huge, right? And uh, the digital gap, just accessing a computer, internet, um, a broadband, let's not talk about like the just north of Ontario, um, mm -hmm. you can lose connectivity. That leaves behind so many people. So where charities and nonprofits come in is how do we provide those resources for free to you to access? Where are the hubs that we can create uh, for you to be able to link to the resources you need? Because being able to access the digital landscape is huge. Um, and that is something we were able to work with government to do. Um, but on another level, it is Someone, I think it was uh, two Muhammads and Abdul, right? Uh, from the yeah. work gap, yeah, the, yeah, the pathways. The presentations. Yes, yeah, so it, was, it was brilliant. And, and one of the things you had brought up was access is our biggest issue. And that's that's what we're trying to work to fix, right? It's like, how do we make it accessible for you to come into community service agencies, to uh, work with schools um, or school boards to ensure that you're not being uh, there aren't gaps in your career development, your career trajectory, and that you're getting to learn across all grades and uh, into your future. We classify youth as 15 to 30, so it's a lot bigger um, in terms of gap, and, and all throughout that, and all throughout that um, age group, right? Age, all yeah. throughout that age group. Um, you will have multiple careers, multiple mm. uh, types of jobs. And it's the biggest skill that we need to teach you is your soft skills. So your soft skills are your biggest proponent to getting most of the jobs you want. And it is um, a fact from surveys that were done through Enveronics uh, that employers have articulated soft skills are the hardest to teach um, and they're the most lucrative when hiring for folks. So that's something that we try to do that you don't also necessarily learn in school. So we try to provide those supports to make you job ready. Awesome, thank you. And I'm, I'm mindful of time because we've, we've just yes. touched question number one. Really and we've gone really, deep. <laughs> really into this question. Yes, we are clearly. But I think what you just said, Akosa, is really important. I, I want to highlight it for the group. Like I think the biggest lie that we are taught in schooling right now is that you're going to go to school and then you're just going to go to this job and keep going up and up and up and up. And that, that sort of like linear model of ascension or whatever it is, I think is no longer the case. Like, well, there might be certain vocations that still demand that. There's a lot more of this and zigzag. And your, your point around building a portfolio career is very much the reality or the future trend that we're seeing. So I'm, I'm really glad you raised that. Okay, on to the next question, reluctance to hiring youth. So we know that 
employers are often uh, looking for specific professional experience in the job market where basically it leaves young people at the bottom of the candidate pool. What are some interesting ideas or resources for youth to gain the work experience so they can get the foot in the door and get that first job? Uh, so we'll start with Jake. Happy to. Uh, I, I was actually thinking during the lengthy answer to the first questions about how each of the folks on this panel will actually provide different resources to youth, often for free through organizations like ACOSWAS, and how those honestly are part of the answer to the second question, which is to say, take advantage of the tons of free, if it's networking or online learning via LinkedIn learning via these organizations, RBC Upskill, it's built in, um, or work integrated learning. I don't know if you all know that term, but it basically means internships, apprenticeships, projects, any opportunity that you have to do real work with a real company is a ticket into that company. You can show them, they're giving you a chance to show them your skills, your capacity. And so any chance you can do that, even unfortunately sometimes for free. Now, thankfully in Canada, I think more and more of the proper internships, certainly the apprenticeships are paid, but even those little projects, because Ripen is fantastic at sometimes doing like a 20 or a 40 or hour minute long or hour long project, those give you a chance to then have that employer say, oh, we want this youth to like this on a half a dozen other things and we're gonna pay them for it. So the, <clears throat> take advantage of the free resources that are out there. Obviously the commission and others do incredible work uh, on a variety of benefits that are provided directly to you. And one thing that I find certainly that if I look back at my time when I was about your age, I, I both wasn't aware of them and the things I was aware of, the online learning or the in-person learning, I didn't avail myself of. So figuring, mining the opportunities of paid internships out there. I mean, the irony is I now work with, let's say a dozen different organizations that are involved in paid apprenticeships and internships and their biggest challenge is getting enough folks to actually do them, right? Mm -hmm. So they've got a free paid internship offered by the government with amazing companies and they can't find the students or the youth to fill those roles which means there's a bit of a mismatch, probably also in terms of what you're looking for and what they're offering. But a ton of the time, it's actually just folks not being aware or not accessing things they are aware of. Should I jump into a question from the audience if we've got one now? Oh, are we doing that? Can oh. we do that? I would love that. Um, question from the audience, I'll, go for it. I'll repeat it but, so that they can uh, I'll hear. repeat your question. Thank you. So how can somebody go on about in terms of searching for those internships, right? And because a lot of times doing the internships, you have to have some sort of background to be eligible for so how could somebody have the roadmap to, let's say, found the internship mm -hmm. and then succeed at it? Mm -hmm. And then how can we could take our career from then on? Great okay, question. so the question was, well, how do you go about a, finding the internship in, in the first place? Because Jake just said, and, he, and Jake is from LinkedIn, so he knows this stuff. Uh, who here hasn't heard of LinkedIn? Oh, <laughs> all right, we'll put that up later, hopefully. It's on me. <laughs> yeah, come find Jake afterwards. Uh, and so how do you find the paid uh, internship opportunities and then from there gain the experience and then find, you know, the job that you want? Does anyone want to take that? I can actually address this because that's why Brightman exists as an organization is to give all youth and students an opportunity to work with employers and to address the experience paradox. You know, you graduate and you apply for a job, but they expect you to have six years of experiences, you basically should start working while you're still like six years old to actually <laughs> qualify for the job. Um, so there's many resources that exist and, and one of them is the Level Up project that's uh, funded by the federal government that Ripen facilitates where we enable students to participate in a project-based experiences, not job experiences. And there's a difference between them. And this addresses what um, Jake mentioned earlier is that Employers value the skills that you have and how, can you showcase the skills that you have not necessarily to align with a specific job. Um, so many of those programs and initiatives that exist, and I think everyone on this panel have their own programs of experiences that they facilitate, uh, but those experiences enable you as a youth to actually apply your skill in a low risk format where the employer also understand that they're supporting you build your portfolio and actually gain meaningful experiences and within that project alone we have delivered over 8,000 paid internships up to date so they're fully subsidized internship and we reduce barriers for the employer because we connect them to youth where they don't necessarily have the same 
opportunity to connect with, with youth because it's virtual, but we use that virtual element to our own advantage where we support um, connecting the youth to employers from across the country. So we have some students who might be in Saskatoon and they work with an employer in BC on a project. Uh, and out of those 8,000 paid internships that we delivered, um, close to almost 70% of the youth have said that they have gotten one or more job offer from this project specifically. Um, so it's a mechanism to actually help you showcase the skills that you have and the opportunities that you have done without necessarily having a full-time job or occupation. Um, many post-secondary institutions now embed experiential learning in the curriculum. So you actually work with employers as you actually build um, those projects. And there's other mechanisms and tools where you can still do simple projects, uh, build your own experiences to help you actually gain that first employment. I think also part of the underlying part of your question is it can be overwhelming. Like the internet is massive. Where do you start? And to that, I would just say, start with what you're hearing today. Just start somewhere. Ripen is um, media's organization, R-I-I-P-E-N. And they basically match employers with students still in school with opportunities so you can get those work experiences before you even graduate. I would start there. LinkedIn, um, there are LinkedIn licenses that you can actually get online on the RBC Future Launch website. And you can go in there and um, take some courses, whatever it is that you want to, to gain uh, so that you can build up your resume. But I think the key takeaway here is it's not about the work experience per se, the job, sorry. It's not about the job experience that you've had, but the skills that you've gained through various experiences that might be paid or unpaid that you want to profile. Uh, I see two more hands, and I'm going to go with it. So the young man on the left, I think you were first. Do you want to ask your question now, and then I'll, I, I see you next. like youth that just moved to this country, maybe around 20 years old, and they've studied, say, medical, uh, the medical path in other countries, will they, like, is there an easier way for them, that type of youth, to get jobs here without going to school all over again? Excellent question. I think everyone heard that, right? Sure, yeah, I can jump okay. in real quick. So one, one easy answer is there are organizations whose job is exactly what you just described. So for instance, I would actually, I'll, I'll take a step back. For almost all of the things that we've recommended and the recommendation I'm about to offer, organizations like Ocosua's members are actually the front door. So their job as employment service organizations is to help all people, all Canadians, all Ontarians, access jobs and to figure out all the different services that we're talking about so that they know which ones are the right ones when you walk in their door. That said, I appreciate it. It's still intimidating to walk in their door. And so specifically, there's an organization called World Education Services, and they actually have a, several equivalents, so I shouldn't just be isolating them, but those organizations' jobs is to help accredit people for the accomplishments they had overseas so that when they come here, it's not as hard to, you know, they, they don't have to start over completely as you were suggesting. Inevitably, there's usually some bridging. There's more learning to do to learn the Canadian equivalent, but at least you don't have to start from scratch. And a huge reason why things like skills-based hiring are so important in our mind is because they help prove that some of the obstacles, the barriers for somebody to do that, to get straight into a nursing job if they're an overseas nurse, are removed if you can show that they have the right skills rather than the right credentials, which is what you're pointing out, obstructs them. So the short answer is there are organizations to help, and I would start with those that are in a COSO's network, and then I would follow with the specifics like World Education Services. All right, thank you so much. Actually, I'll just add something Please. because that's yeah, a lived experience stuff. of my family who were engineers who studied in different countries globally, and, and when we moved here, um, we were surprised that you can't actually practice your degrees or anything else. and. Uh, 30 plus years of, of experiences abroad and globally was not recognized, which is a challenge. Um, now I moved here when I was 17 and I was at that age starting university and I was so lost and I'm still at most of the time, but I learned so many things along the way. So my youngest sister who I convinced her to do software engineering because I did engineering too. <laughs> and she's actually graduating soon. And I called her my retirement plan because I, put all my learning for the past 16 years in Canada to my sisters so she actually know 
what to do. And it's a challenge, especially if you move to the country from regulated professions like medicine, engineering, accounting, or law. It's really hard to translate those knowledges. There's so many barriers that exist. That's it's really challenging. But I know the government is trying to address these issues because there's a huge skill shortage for those fields. And many immigrants are being brought into the country because of these professions, yet they cannot practice. Uh, one of my family friends used to be a neurosurgeon who worked across Asia and Europe, and now he can he was brought in as a neurosurgeon, but he unfortunately can't practice, or the path might be really challenging. Uh, as Jake mentioned, there are some organizations that are trying to address this, and I think the government's also building programs, initiatives to help skilled immigrants transition to high, um, high, like highly skilled occupations to address this issue as well. I think um, if you don't mind me suggesting something, Please. I think instead of like just making them, maybe not just like, I know that you don't have to start over exactly, but maybe instead of making them relearn some of the stuff they've already learned, maybe just like learning the language and then like oh. being able to learn like the names of the tools, the things they use, and then getting back to the job would be like a better way instead of relearning stuff they've already learned, re le uh, they run in their life. Completely agree. Totally. Absolutely. Okay. Totally. I want to give Sharif and, and uh, the professional service provider here, Akosa, no, the opportunity to chime in, and then we can get more questions from the audience. Go I appreciate that. And I will say, um, right to his question earlier, that is exactly what our service providers do, right? So, um, Generally, it's newcomers, settlement agencies is who we work with, and we provide that foreign language training or English, like English training, um, so that we're using your credentials, like the credentials that you come with from the other countries. It's similar, it's similar stories that we have uh, in my family as well, where your auditing degree means nothing, your ge geography degree means nothing, right? When you come here, um, but it's what are those skill sets that we can provide? And that's generally what our employment service providers do. It's how do we provide you those transferable or transitional skills, if you will, to get you those jobs you want. Um, and can I just say one quick thing to the internship question really quickly? Sure. Canada Summer Jobs, it will come up in May, June. Um, and, and that's generally where people are looking for internships, jobs. It's, it's online, right? Um, easily Googleable. And you can utilize that, or you can go to service agencies that will provide you the, so service agents, if you go to firstwork.org, um, that's, that's my organization. We have, we have a, a map based on your postal code. So you just enter your postal code, it'll tell you which service organization to go to. And then they will provide you, there is a youth summer jobs uh, like connection. So it's the summer jobs that are available and also year round jobs. So they will build your skill sets first and then uh, match you with an employer. Okay, so we've heard Ripen, FirstWorks, uh, LinkedIn licenses on the rbc.com slash future launch website. Uh, and maybe Sharif will chime in with other resources or ideas. Well, I think this is just an interesting like meta conversation in terms of the, all the questions that we were hoping to get through, like the skill piece, like. Like it's a skill to know how to navigate all of these different 100%. resources and opportunities. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a skill to know which information I you know we is is the best to access. Like those are skills that we should be thinking about in our education systems, in our organizational systems. Uh, like like I I actually think that the issue around access is more related to critical thinking and knowing how to sift through everything mm -hmm. versus like that there aren't. There's been many projects and youth strategies we've developed as an organization. And in a lot of them we're hearing, we're seeing that there's actually quite a few resources available. It's not, it's just how, to, how, how do I access? And learning that how is very, very important. It also, this whole conversation also kind of clarifies the importance of conferences like this um, because policy matters. Policy makes a difference. Your voice is going to be uh, organized by the STC over the next few weeks and months, and we're going to start to try to make some changes in systems. And STC, uh, we uh, we actually 
facilitate on behalf of the Ministry of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, a youth advisory group of newcomers, uh, immigrants and refugees. And this topic of credentials comes up constantly. And we have a we have a guiding lens to help our conversations at Canada We Want, addressing structural racism. And it's becoming clearer and clearer that the, the policy related to credentials is potentially rooted in structural in, in isms that we've been talking about in structural racism. So there is a going to be a call out for a new cohort of the youth advisory group, and these folks provide direct advice to the minister. It's those spaces as well that not only help to build your skills, build your resume. It's those spaces are also critical in helping to change how policy is made in this country because that policy can have a huge impact on a lot of people. And when the voices who are affected by the policy are not part of the conversation, sometimes the a lot of, most of the times the policy is not the right policy. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about how to kind of address these questions because they're not simple answers. They're answers that require um, this kind of this kind of complex complex thinking around how we can change policy. I, I'm going to take two more questions in the room because I saw your hands. Uh, oh, we want to let's. Uh -huh. uh, a couple. I'm going to lose the thoughts. There were a couple of things. Um, yeah. So Akosawa named some summer programs for securing jobs. Something I've seen. If you're a first person in your family to go to school, like higher ed, higher ed. If uh, first person in, in your family to do that, or you're a newcomer or ch a child of newcomers, um, sometimes you miss that nuance around job application and those cycles. And I've noticed this with even family members of mine. You know, you are actually securing those jobs much earlier in the season than you you realize. It's not like the school school term is done, and then you look for a job. They're they're gone. Those jobs are gone. So kind of like pick your head up. I know you're working hard and look around and start looking for those resources. I would say February, March. Don't apply for summer jobs when your school year is done. That's like a huge miss often that I see. Okay, I think you were next and then we'll take the other questions. Um, how do you stress that you put mental disadvantages such as anxiety, autism, et cetera, have equal access to jobs when job applications revolve around social interaction, such as interviews, which makes it hard for many to be accepted into the jobs even though they are qualified. Excellent question. Wow. So yeah, we've, we've been talking about a certain brand of youth so far, and it actually ties in nicely with our question. The question is around, for folks on the line, uh, how do we ensure that we are incorporating these solutions for people who experience different mental challenges or um, different abilities and ensure that they are brought into the conversation around solutions so that we don't leave any young people behind. Uh, do you want to take that? Can I start? Yes, please. Um, so there's this platform called Discoverability. Um, and it is... Discoverability. Yes, okay. Discoverability. Um, and it is a platform geared towards all, like all youth, but specifically youth that, uh, you know, face autism, uh, like have autism, um, have um, other abilities, right? Like, and, and um, primarily, it is employers that have the accommodations that are built in to make that successful, because it is not on the youth to make sure that they're okay, they're, they're completely qualified for the job, but often the barrier is the employer. And so how do we make employers um, more accommodating, right? And so what we try to do as community based organizations is we advocate employers to change their rules, to change their accommodations, and to change the way they work with our youth. Um, and discoverability is, is it, it's a job platform. It's employers that are already on board that agree with Got the it. stance. And that's why I wanted to start off there, because I'm like, they are the employers that are saying yes to it. Less first. of an uphill battle. Less They're already on battle. there. Exactly. And, and so job seekers can go on to discoverability to find those Exactly. opportunities. That's great and to know. if I can also add, we collaborate with a network of other service providers that offer support for both the employer and the job seeker, the youth. And one of them is Special Serna, 
um, that focuses on individuals on the spectrum specifically, but they support employers in building strategies to make the work environment more inclusive. And the transition to a virtual work environment actually sometimes works in favor of individuals with disability or on the spectrum because it helped limit um, some of the barriers that they face. And there's other organization, I think they're called Willing, Ready, and Able. Yeah. Unless I'm, what is yeah. it? Willing, ready, and able. Yeah. Willing, ready, and able. Okay. WRA, and they actually help both um, individuals with um, disabilities to transition to employment, and they support many employers as well. So there's some resources, but again, it comes to the idea of trying to find those resources and right. see what aligns with um, the individual and the employer as well. But as Akosu mentioned, the burden is definitely on the employer to make sure that the workplace is inclusive and accessible for the youth and job seeker. I sort of want to echo, I was going to say what Akosu said from the exact opposite direction, but the same statement, which is to say, I would be very explicit about your disabilities when you're applying for jobs if you can. And I, it's, it's almost brought. Do you need to disclose, eyes. basically. To disclose, saying, yeah, exactly. Feel like, comfortable to disclose. I'll, I'll give an example. When um, Mark Beckles earlier was referring, was I, I was in tears when he was in tears around his son because I too struggle with addiction, and I, I find it really hard, like, to even put that on an application. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think it's really important that we put all of our abilities and disabilities, um, often overlapping, on an application because. I find, for instance, well, let's use somebody on, on the autistic spectrum as an example. I think it's a great example because I can't focus. I'm really bad at focusing. And I probably don't have, as far as clinic, many clinicians have examined me and suggested I don't have a disability in that respect, but I still have struggle to focus. And one skill that a lot of folks on the spectrum have is the ability to focus really deeply in ways that many people can't. And so figuring out how to, like, what your superpower is, so to speak, I, we were, I was uh, struggling last night with a good friend who uh, is in accounting, actually runs the wealth, wealth management for a part of Scotia, and they can't find bookkeepers because one of the lost skills right now is the ability to focus enough to do bookkeeping. Wow. And so there are huge gaps in our society that should be filled by people with the full range of abilities. And the challenge is finding the employers, to a coastal point, who want to support them. So be explicit about it, and then if the employer doesn't hire you as a result, you probably don't want to work for them. And if right. they do, all the more reason to lean in. You just found somebody who's going to embrace your superpower. Right. I, I, I do want to take the question from the audience, from someone we haven't heard yes. from yet. Is that okay? No, okay? Or do you want to chime in? I just, really, I just really quickly just wanted to, to share that I think, I think lived experience, experience is a tremendous asset. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, okay. Uh, is, a, is a tremendous asset that should be, be brought forward. And it can be, there are situations, and I think this platform about discoverability, please let us join yes. that. <laughs> um, this platform is a great resource to know which employers it can be safe to bring that right. lived experience forward to. Um, because that sense of, um, we have to make sure that the onus isn't on the individual right. and that the onus is actually on the employer, as you've been saying, to make sure that that is, uh, and so this platform is great because I think that we're moving into a direction in this space where that lived experience is seen as an asset and can be shared openly. And there are still some spaces, and it, I think it really depends on the context and the community and the, the type of organization. There are still some places where that um, that lived experience might not be seen as an asset and it might be, it might be harmful to bring that forward to that into that space right so i think there's uh i i'm feeling you know in over 20 years of working in youth work that the the the, the, pedis, the, the balance is really 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 shifted mm -hmm. um and just just to make sure that we're we're continuously putting that onus on the employer versus on uh the individual i think is um is really important the interview uh, it's in, like one of the other parts to your question is just the the that's been in my mind is just the, I think someone had said earlier, I think it was you, Jake, who had mentioned that uh, just ba ba balancing the skills and the, and the talents. Like, um, so we've, we've actually, um, we have this platform called Plum that we use. It's mm -hmm. a psychological learning like assessment and it just helps determine which talents drive you and what drain you. It doesn't mean you're not good at something. It just means there's certain things that drive you and give you energy and there's some things that drain you. And we've just kind of seen that the whole um, the whole uh, job recruitment process, when we don't 
completely lean on the interview. I, I think we used to do in the 20th century. Uh, when we don't completely lean on the interview, we have multiple tools to be able to make that decision. Um, that's where we start to see like the playing field really uh, mm. leveled. Uh, so I would also kind of encourage employers to kind of, you know, I think I still think the interview is a good tool in order to in order to build a relationship and can be done in a safe way that doesn't result in, in harm. And I think there's other tools that play a critical role in, uh, in uh, like like those like these online tools that we've been talking about that help to build that job profile. So so yeah, I think I just wanted to bring that forward to your question as well. Thank you so much. Um, we have questions from online. Can okay. I take the question? He's been yes. very patient. Go for <laughs> um, it. My question is like as you guys mentioned before, gaining more skills is going to like get you more job opportunities. Well, my question is as we see like the technology and the AI has been developing in the past three years, four years crazy and like it's been doing a lot of stuff that humans are doing are we going to reach a point as youth in the future that ai is going to do most of the stuff that we're going to start like losing our jobs no matter how skills you have no not not unless we have generalized AI. this is my favorite question because th th there's one thing that history teaches us which is that people ask exactly your question like at the level of the prime minister to students throughout history and when i'm talking about through throughout history i mean like when people first started to use like a stone to crack open something that they couldn't open with their hands, they were worried, oh, what are all the people who just use their hands to open that thing do? And uh, having been through, bizarrely, because I'm, you know, I'm not that old, at least one or two of these cycles where people claimed that robotic automation or other forms of automation would remove jobs from our workforce, in the short term, sometimes they do, but over history, they always open up more. And I think the great benefit of AI is hopefully if it's regulated right and we have to your questions like yours should instead of making us say no we're not going to use ai they should instead make everybody think a lot harder about how they use all technology because it's all now in some ways backed by some form of machine learning and ai and to the extent that the answer to that question is use technology to benefit humans and humanity and human dignity go with it and if to the contrast as a lot of tech is currently doing it's actually in the long term hurting us then we should rethink whether we use it, AI or not. And the last thing I'll say on this is one of the best talks I've ever seen was by Gary Kasparov. Kasparov was a chess genius. He was the global chess champion. And he's got a lot of interesting things to say about Ukraine and Russia as well, because he was more or less kicked out of Russia by Putin. But on chess and computers, he was one of the first folks, grandmasters, to be beat by a computer. And he didn't take it very well. Uh, it was sort of embarrassing watching the whole thing. But after about a decade, he's now one of the biggest advocates of human-computer interaction that is balanced by human dignity. So now he's the one who's been proving over and over again that a human plus a computer is always more powerful than a computer or a human. And the key is to ensure that the aspects of humanity that we care about most, things like creativity, are the skills that you're working on. Because if you're working on things that can be automated, then yes, you're right, you do have something to worry about. But if, in the, in the con by contrast, you're working on how to work with a computer to highlight your humanity, creativity is just the most obvious example, but critical thinking is another good one, then I think you will actually have an advantage over everybody who hasn't thought through those questions. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add something your way. for like 20 seconds. In my 12 years as a professional student, I actually research autonomous vehicles and AI. And I know there's that fear of like replacing the human and, and jobs, but that's not the case because AI could never replicate the human's ability, critical thinking and communication and the emotion element of it as much as possible. And the data that AI is built on, most of the cases is biased, which, which actually will raise many issues in the future that will require a lot of changes and modifications. Um, but I believe it will, open up new fields of studies. It will enable a lot more application and it might address so many issues in automation that will just open up a whole new sectors and industry. Uh, but I don't, I'm just gonna copy paste everything Jake mentioned and just add that I don't think it will replace um, humans because machines could, our brains is a very complex machine that could not be replicated. So there's that piece that we um, need to look at AI as a, in a positive sense and still be able to adapt with the changes and all the stuff that are happening. Thank you. So do we need to worry about chat GPT? The answer is no. <laughs> okay, 
So we have room for one more question from online. Um, the question is, thank you for your question, online person. Can we create more and easier ways for high school students to work while gaining credits? Because there are some students who find it very hard to stay in class without earning any money. Uh, Want to take this on? Anyone? I wish that uh, the co-op education program could go back to what it used to be. Um, co-op education, for those of you who don't know, co-op education is like when you do a placement and you get a credit for it. And when I was in high school, like I was fully immersed in the in the job and I didn't have to write an essay or do a culminating project at the end of it. And actually Students Commission in Canada was started, was like powered by co-op students in the first few years of the organization. And then high school and, and it kept us working with with youth who were 12 to 17, which is which is where we where, where the focus goes because of their rights under the UN Convention. Um, but what's happened is that we have taken away the practical part of the co-op and made it a lot more academically oriented in a lot of education curricula. And I think that that would be a number one, like a, a quick and easy policy solution to provide an opportunity for someone to get their credits um, through through some of through this program. Some of the best hires that we've had as an organization have been those folks who um, struggled with high school uh, academically, but had a tremendous amount of assets to give. And I just think, you know, a, a quick policy solution would be to like reform co-op education and, and, and other provinces it's called work ed, work ed, but to make it just really focused on the job and not make it focused on passing a test or writing right. an essay. On, on that last theme, if I can slip this in, because we haven't had a chance to talk about this, but what about folks who are interested in entrepreneurship um, and starting their own businesses? Like, how can we help young people uh, build sustainable businesses for themselves? Maybe just skip the whole higher ed thing. Anyone? I'll, I'll yeah. go for it. take the first crack at yes, it. Please. Um, there are programs, again, across. Well, Ontario for sure. I'm sure that there are Canada wide, but there are programs that are uh, geared towards youth that are interested in entrepreneurship. So you you teach them the basic skills, right? Like how do you you know kickstart your plan? How do you get your funding? How do you pitch to um, uh, pitch to folks? It's uh, there's one program here in in the GTA called Business in the Streets. Business in the Streets. Business in the one Streets. One such program. Yes. Uh, it is, yeah, they are, oh, I'm glad, yeah, uh, they are well-known, very, uh, it's a great program, they teach uh, all youth, and it's free, right, so it's, it's you just, free, uh, yeah, good, you have to just apply, apply for it, and, and you will uh, get it, but I'm sure, Jake, yeah, I'll jump in with a few more, so, Please. to you, just throw organization names out that have resources for you all, from past parts of this conversation as well, and the disabilities question in Ontario, there's something called the Ontario Disability Employment Network, they are a member of ACOSWA's network and have uh, a, a huge percentage of the organizations that support people with disabilities around employment as part of their network. So if you want to focus on that, they're a good one. Um, on uh, what skills do you already have and what jobs do you want to be looking at? There's a couple different resources that are called Career Explorer. So if you just Google Career Explorer, there's a Canadian startup that did a great job of a 30 minute questionnaire called So Can You. And LinkedIn so has, can you? So can you? So Career Explorer. Once, if you hit Google, Google Career Explorer, Career Explorer, then you'll see so and can select you. So, so can, can you is one, and then another is LinkedIn. So there's LinkedIn, LinkedIn Career Explorer, which also has a bunch of equivalent supports for you. Type in job, it tells you what skills are like between that job and another one that you might be interested in. So say you're a bartender, it'll, for instance, direct you towards emergency services response because they have overlapping skill requirements. Um, I would also highly recommend the interview prep resources on LinkedIn if you go under job. And then finally, uh, so literally just click on jobs and they've got interview prep resources. And then- Also, oh, if you go to LinkedIn <laughs> jobs, you can find interview resources on there. Okay, For I didn't every know that. job that you type in, it'll actually have the equivalent questions so you can prep in advance. Oh, good to um, know. And now I've completely lost track of, oh, the question was accelerator. So if you do want to be an entrepreneur, there's probably more resources available for you than any other industry <laughs> combined, probably in the sense that there are these things called accelerators or incubators for almost every level, including high school. 
And so as an example, uh, if you look up Startup Weekend, it's run by one of the largest global accelerators called Techstars, but they list in Toronto every week competitions that are happening around entrepreneurship. So if you have an idea for a company, just sign up to the Toronto Startup Weekend, or if you're in BC or Manitoba, sign up for the Winnipeg Startup Weekend, Start, Startup Digest, excuse me. So Techstars Startup Digest is the email list. One of the types of events they run is called a Startup Weekend, which is a competition to build a company in a weekend. And there are many others. That one's really focused on tech, but there are accelerators and incubators focused on agriculture and aquatics, from uh, social services through to education. Find the one that relates to your interests in building a business. I've built a couple of successful businesses, like Canada's largest boot camp, Lighthouse Labs, and highly recommend that you test out these many, many, many free, usually government-funded resources. Thanks so much, Jake. So on that note, we're going to wrap up this panel. I want to thank you all for such an engaging conversation. And for everyone in the room, thank you so much for jumping in and asking your questions. That was totally not planned, but it went really well. <laughs>